Gracias. Good evening. <clears throat> from, <clears throat> from time to time, we all ask deep and difficult questions. Why is the world filled with trouble? How can we make it better? How do we give meaning and purpose to our lives? Well, as difficult as these questions are, uh, many people have answers to these questions. For example, morality is dictated by God in holy scriptures. When everyone obeys his laws, the world will be perfect. Or, problems are the fault of evil people who must be shamed, punished, and defeated. Or, our tribe should claim its rightful greatness under the control of a strong leader who embodies its authentic virtue. Or, in the past, we lived in a state of order and harmony until alien forces brought on decadence and degeneration. We must restore the society to its golden age. Well, what about the rest of us? Many people know what they don't believe, but have much more trouble identifying what they do believe. In my book, Enlightenment Now, in Defensa de la Ilustración, uh, I argue that there is an alternative system of beliefs and values, the one that we associate with the Enlightenment. That is, that we can use knowledge to enhance human flourishing. Many people embrace the ideals of the Enlightenment without being able to name or describe them. And as a result, they faded into the background as a bland default or status quo or establishment. The other ideologies have passionate advocates, and I suggest that Enlightenment ideals too need a positive defense and an explicit commitment. And that is what I have tried to do uh, in, in uh, the book. The Enlightenment values, I suggest, can be divided into uh, four, reason, science, humanism, and progress. Let me say a few words about each one. It all begins with reason with the understanding that traditional sources of belief are generators of delusion. Faith, revelation, tradition, authority, charisma, mysticism, intuition, the parsing of sacred texts are all ways of being wrong. Reason, in contrast, is non-negotiable. As soon as you try to provide reasons why we should trust anything other than reason, as soon as you explain why you're right, why other people should believe you, that you're not lying or full of crap, you've lost the argument because you have appealed to reason. Now, as a cognitive psychologist, I would be the first to acknowledge that human beings on their own are not particularly reasonable. As a species, we are likely to generalize from anecdotes. We reason from stereotypes. We seek evidence that confirms our beliefs, and we ignore evidence that disconfirms them. And we're all overconfident about our own knowledge, wisdom, and rectitude. But people are capable of reason if they adopt certain norms. Free speech, open criticism and debate, logical analysis, fact-checking, and empirical testing, which leads to the second enlightenment value, science. Science is based on the conviction that the world is intelligible, that we can understand the world by formulating possible explanations and testing them against reality. Science has shown itself to be our most reliable means of understanding the world, including ourselves. An important enlightenment theme was that there can be a science of human nature and that beliefs about society are testable just like any other beliefs about the world. The third theme is humanism, that the ultimate moral purpose is to reduce the suffering and enhance the flourishing of human beings and other sentient creatures. Well, enhance human flourishing, you might think, who could possibly be against that? In fact, there are alternatives to humanism, such as that the ultimate good is to enhance the glory of the tribe, the nation, the race, the class, or the faith to obey the dictates of a divinity and pressure others to do the same, to achieve feats of heroic greatness, 
or to advance a mystical dialectic or struggle or pursuit of a utopian or messianic age. Humanism is feasible because people are endowed with a sense of sympathy, a concern with the welfare of others. By default, our circle of sympathy is rather small. We tend to feel the pain only of our biological relatives, our close uh, friends and allies, um, cute little furry baby animals, uh, and that's about it. But we can expand our sense of sympathy through the processes of cosmopolitanism, the mixing of people and ideas through education, through journalism, through art, through mobility, and uh, even uh, from reason itself. I, uh, a point that has been impressed on me by my other half, Rebecca Goldstein, that as soon as you engage in discourse with someone else, uh, I can't say that my, only my interests are special because I'm me and you're not, and hope for you to take me seriously. And finally, that leads to progress, that if we apply knowledge and sympathy to reduce suffering and enhance flourishing, we can gradually succeed. So, 250 years later, how did that enlightenment thing work out? Well, I have found that if you ask most intellectuals, the answer is not very well, because intellectuals, I find, hate progress. And intellectuals who call themselves progressive really hate progress. <laughs> if you think we can solve problems, I have been told, that means that you have a blind faith and a quasi-religious belief in the outmoded superstition of the false promise of the myth of the onward march of inevitable progress. You are a cheerleader for vulgar American can-do-ism with the rah-rah spirit of boardroom ideology, Silicon Valley, and the Chamber of Commerce. You are a practitioner of Whig history, a naive optimist, a Pollyanna, and of course a Pangloss, alluding to the Voltaire character who declared all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Well, as it happens, Professor Pangloss was a pessimist. A true optimist would believe there can be much better worlds than the one that we have today. But this is irrelevant because the question of whether progress has occurred is not a matter of optimism or temperament or personality or seeing the glass as half full. Uh, it's an empirical hypothesis. Human well-being can be measured. Life, health, sustenance, prosperity, peace, freedom, safety, knowledge, leisure, happiness, if they have increased over time, I submit that would be progress. Well, let's go to the data. Beginning with the most precious thing of all, life. For most of human history, life expectancy at birth uh, hovered around 30 years of age. But then with the invention of vaccination, sanitation, antibiotics, and other advances in public health and medicine, life expectancy at birth uh, is now worldwide 71 years, and no one guesses that it's that high. Now, the conquest of early death was highly uneven across regions of the world. It took place first in Europe and the Americas, but more recently, Asia has almost caught up, and Sub-Saharan Africa has shown spectacular gains. The biggest cause of low life expectancy is, the, is child mortality, the death of children. In Sweden, 250 years ago, one-third of children did not live to see their fifth birthday. Sweden brought its rate of child mortality down by a factor of 100, and every other part of the world has followed. In North America, Canada, in uh, Asia, South Korea, in, uh, in uh, South America, Chile, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Ethiopia, which has brought its rate down from uh, 30, from 25% um, just 30 years ago to 6% today, that's still much too high, but the progress is continuing. Mothers, too, were in mortal danger when, when uh, they gave birth. In Sweden, 250 years ago, 1% of childbirths ended with the death of the mother. That was brought down by a factor of 250, as it was in other parts of the world, such as the United States, uh, Malaysia, and Ethiopia. Health. 
The biggest killer for most of human history was infectious disease. That is no longer a major source of death in rich countries, but continues to kill people, especially children, in poor countries. But the five most lethal infectious diseases have all uh, been uh, reduced in their mortality rates just in the last 15 years, pneumonia, diarrhea, malaria, measles, and HIV AIDS. Sustenance. Uh, famine was one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse and could strike any population anywhere in the world. Uh, and it's only recently that countries have had the ability to feed themselves. It takes about 2,500 calories to feed a young uh, adult male. And with the agricultural revolution in England, the advances in uh, uh, the science of agronomy, such as crop rotation, the invention of synthetic fertilizers, the mechanization of agriculture, uh, the selective breeding of vigorous hybrids in the Green Revolution, and transportation networks that could bring food from farm to table. Uh, first, England developed the ability to feed itself, the United States, uh, France. More recently, China and India have become self-sufficient in food, and here is a graph for the world as a whole. Now, this would be a dubious form of progress if all of those calories were just making people uh, obese. But in fact, they have also been applied to reduce the rate of undernourishment, which used to be to affect 35% of people in the developing world. That has been fallen uh, to less than 15%, first in Latin America, then in Asia, and more recently in Sub-Saharan Africa. And thanks to the increased availability of food, deaths from famines have uh, plummeted to a fraction of what they were um, 150 years ago. Prosperity. The for, uh, natural state of uh, humanity is poverty. Poverty needs no explanation. It's wealth that needs an explanation. And for most of human history, there was little uh, economic growth to speak of. We can see this in a graph of the gross world product for the world from the year one to the present, which shows that for 1,600 years, economic growth was less than one pixel high. Then with the Industrial Revolution and advances in technology, in the spread of education, the growth of markets and institutions like uh, finance and, uh, and a legal system, finally globalization, gross world product has increased by a factor of about 200 since the uh, uh, early 18th century. Again, the great escape, as the economist Angus Deaton calls it, from universal poverty and squalor was highly uneven over the world's surface. Uh, it was first the UK and the US that escaped from um, universal poverty, but more recently, South Korea has shown spectacular gains uh, in Latin America, Chile, and China and India are show, showing exponential growth. Uh, I, uh, for local interest, I also uh, found a graph that plots, uh, puts Spain on these coordinates. So over here in purple, you can see the, gross, the uh, growth of uh, GDP per capita in Spain, which kind of leveled off around the time of the Great Recession. This graph just goes to 2016, but there has been an increase in GDP per capita in Spain uh, since then. Now again, all of this growth in prosperity would be a dubious form of progress if it was all just going to the uh, 1%. But in fact, it uh, has dramatically reduced the rate of extreme poverty, uh, defined as $1.90 in 2011 dollars per person per day. By that criterion, 200 years ago, 90% of the world lived in extreme poverty. Today, it is less than 9%. In fact, there has been a 75% drop in extreme poverty uh, just in the last 30 years, and virtually no one knows about it. Because poor countries have been getting richer faster than rich countries have been getting richer, international inequality, the gap between rich and poor countries, uh, has turned a corner. It necessarily increased after the Industrial Revolution as a few countries escaped from universal poverty. More recently, as the poor countries of the world uh, have started to, to catch up, uh, in, in, international inequality has started to decline. 
Now, of course, within rich countries, uh, inequality has increased, it has not decreased, but this doesn't mean that rich countries have become indifferent to the uh, situation of the, uh, the needy. Quite the contrary, 150 years ago, European countries devoted about 1.5% of their gross domestic product to social spending, to children, to the sick, to the uh, aged, to the poor. But in the 20th century, every uh, rich country uh, embarked on a massive program of redistribution of social spending so that today the median OECD country uh, redistributes 22% of its gross domestic product uh, to the uh, less well-off. Uh, there is no such thing as a wealthy capitalist country without a welfare state. Uh, including the United States, and for all of the opposition to social spending in the United States, it is still uh, significant. And as a result, poverty, when measured in disposable income, that is after taxes and transfers, has declined from about one-third, 33% in 1960, to 7% today. And when you take into account the falling cost of food and clothing and shelter, it's declined from 30% to less than 3%. Peace. Uh, this is a painting that uh, Rebecca and I saw today uh, not very far from here. Uh, but a, uh, a nice symbol of the horrors of war. War it used, was, for most of human history, the natural state of relations between empires and countries, and peace was just a brief interval between wars. You can see this in a graph of the percentage of years that the great powers of the day, the empires, the, uh, the big states, uh, were at each other's throats in great power wars. And what the graph, over the last uh, of more than 500 years, what this graph shows is that three or 400 years ago, the great powers were pretty much always at war. Now, they are never at war. The last great power war pitted the United States against China in uh, Korea more than 65 years ago. Now, if we zoom in on the 20th century, we see that even as wars were getting shorter and less frequent, the ones that did take place were uh, massively destructive, particularly World War I and uh, World War II. But World War II marked a turning point that contrary to predictions that I and many people in this room grew up with, that it was only a matter of time before we would see World War III with pitting the United States against the Soviet Union with nuclear weapons and resulting in even greater destruction, the Cold War ended, the Soviet Union went out of existence peacefully, and World War III never happened. In fact, if we zoom in now on the period since World War II, we see that from a rate of death in uh, all wars combined of about 20 per 100,000 per year, the world has gone on a bumpy downward trajectory to less than one per 100,000 per year. Uh, it's an uneven uh, progress with peaks for the Korean War and the Chinese Civil War, the Vietnam War, the Iran-Iraq War, and the Syrian Civil War, but the overall trend is massively downward. Freedom and rights. We all have been uh, alarmed, as uh, Teresa mentioned, by the retreat from democracy in many countries in the world, most dramatically in countries like uh, Turkey and Venezuela and in uh, Russia and Hungary. Nonetheless, if you count up the number of democracies and autocracies, scaled by how democratic or how autocratic they are, you see that the world has never been more democratic than it has been in the last uh, decade. Now, this is, should be obvious enough uh, here in Spain, which not too long ago was a, uh, a fascist dictatorship, as was Portugal. Uh, and we have to remember that not so long ago, the world had only 31 democracies. That was true in, when I was a student in the 1970s. Together with, in Europe, Spain and Portugal, Greece was under the control of a military dictatorship. Half of Europe was behind the Iron Curtain and uh, controlled by uh, communist dictatorships. 
almost all of Latin America was ruled by military and right-wing authoritarian dictatorships. East Asia, Taiwan, South Korea, Philippines, Indonesia, all of them uh, ruled by military dictatorships, all of them democratic today. Child labor, for uh, the natural thing that people do with children is they put them to work and uh, in farms and then in factories. In England in 1850, about 30% of children were uh, employed in farms and fact factories. With the uh, growth of prosperity, so that parents did not depend on the labor of their children. With the premium on, on education, the fact that children were more valuable in school than in the fields. And with a general value, increased valuation of the lives of children, uh, uh, the entire world has been reducing the rate of child labor. Uh, other countries such as Italy and the world as a whole has brought the rate of child labor down. This was recognized uh, three years ago when Kailash Satyarthi won the Nobel Peace Prize or was uh, one of the two winners of the Nobel Peace Prize. He shared it uh, for his efforts at bringing down the rate of child labor. Violent crime. In any part of the world that lives in a state of anarchy, there will be violent uh, predation of the, uh, on the weak by, by the, uh, the strong and the well-armed, often leading to revenge, to dueling, to cycles of uh, feuding and vendetta. For example, in medieval Europe, the average homicide rate uh, was about 35 per 100,000 per year. Then with the establishment of uh, monarchies that gained control over territories, uh, replacing the medieval patchwork of uh, fiefs and baronies and principalities, the code of honor and the cycles of, of uh, feuding were replaced by the king's justice and rates of homicide went down in every European country so that now they're now about one per 100,000 per year. This process is repeated whenever the anarchy of frontier regions is brought under the control of the rule of law. It happened again in colonial New England. It happened in the American Wild West, which is familiar from the old cowboy movies. And uh, it happened, for example, in Mexico, which still has one of the world's highest homicide rates. But a century ago, it was five times higher than it is today. If we zoom in on the uh, last 50 years or so, we see that the United States and many other European countries underwent a, a reversal in the crime rate in the 1960s, but the reversal was in turn reversed and uh, the American crime rate has fallen by about half in the last uh, 25 years. And this is true of the world as a whole. They, there's been a 30% reduction in the homicide rate uh, worldwide. Not just homicide, but violence against women, such as uh, <clears throat> domestic violence against wives and girlfriends, and rates of rape and sexual assault. These data are from the United States, but I believe they are similar in Europe. And the rate of victimization of children, such as bullying, has come down, both violent victimization at school and the uh, exploitation of children by caregivers in physical abuse and sexual abuse have all come down. In fact, we've become safer in just about every way. Because of advances in the uh, safety technology of automobiles and in the design of highways, uh, your chance of dying in a car accident have fallen by about 96%. Uh, we are 88% less likely to be killed on the sidewalk as pedestrians, 99% less likely to die in a plane crash. Uh, in the year 2018, the number of deaths in commercial plane crashes, crashes across the world was zero. We are 59% less likely to fall to our deaths, 90% less likely to drown, 92% less likely to die in a fire, 92% uh, less likely to be asphyxiated, but there is one exception in the United States to the trend of increasing safety, and this is the category that safety uh, statisticians call death by poison, solid, or liquid. And here you see the American opioid epidemic, the huge increase in the number of drugs from, uh, of, of uh, overdose deaths from uh, opioid drugs, a counterexample to the general trend of increasing safety. At the same time, we're 95% less likely to be killed on the job. We're even less likely to die in a so-called act of God. 
in the drought, uh, a drought, a flood, a wildfire, a landslide, a meteor strike, an earthquake, uh, presumably not because God is any less angry with us, uh, but because of improvements in warning systems, in the resilience of infrastructure, and in emergency response systems. And what about the quintessential act of God, the projectile hurled by Zeus, the literal bolt from the blue? Yes, we are 97% less likely to be killed by a bolt of lightning. Knowledge. The natural state of uh, humankind is illiteracy, and in uh, the early modern period in Europe, literacy was a privilege that was reserved only for uh, the, uh, a small religious and aristocratic minority, about 15% of the population. But then uh, every European country and, um, uh, achieved universal literacy by the 20th century, as did, of course, the United States, uh, Chile, Mexico is coming very close. And in fact, the world as a whole uh, has achieved 80% literacy, 90% for people under the age of uh, 25. And in what is perhaps the most shocking, incredible, difficult to believe example of human progress, we have been getting smarter. This is true. In a well-documented phenomenon called the Flynn effect, IQ scores have increased all over the world by three points a decade for a century, a result of the expansion of education and of the trickling down of abstract and technical concepts from uh, academia and science and technology into everyday life. Well, have any of these gains actually improved the quality of our life? And the answer is, uh, in many ways, they have. For example, 150 years ago, the average work week in Western Europe and the United States was 62 hours per week. Today, it is uh, uh, less than 40 hours. Uh, in the United States, uh, the uh, typical worker gets three weeks of paid vacation. In Europe, it is typically uh, longer. Uh, uh, a cons a, a, an idea that would have almost been inconceivable in the 19th century. And thanks to the universal uh, penetration of running water and electricity, and the widespread adoption of labor-saving devices like washing machines, vacuum cleaners, refrigerators, dishwashers, stoves, and microwaves, the amount of our lives that we lose to housework, which people say is their least favorite way of spending their time, has gone down from 60 hours a week to 15 hours a week. Because of the uh, shrinking work week and the shrinking amount of time that we waste on housework, the amount of leisure time that uh, Americans have has increased in the last uh, 50 years or so, both for uh, men and for women. Now, you can't help but notice that, at least in the United States, leisure time for women kind of leveled off in 1990. And the reason is that women today spend more time with their children. In fact, a single working woman today spends more time with her children than a married stay-at-home uh, mother did in the 1950s. So the nostalgia about the close uh, family and the uh, quality time that we kind of attribute to the 1950s turns out uh, uh, not to be true. Well, th does any of this make us any happier? These are all the kinds of things that economists love to measure, but uh, do they actually uh, affect what counts? And the answer is that they, that, uh, that they do. As countries become more uh, affluent, their happiness on average tends to uh, go up. In 71% uh, of countries, uh, for which we have data on happiness over the last uh, 40 years or so, there has been an increase. Uh, the United States is not one of them, but uh, the United States was pretty happy to begin with. And once again, I have uh, added a graph in which I plot the happiness of Spain. So there was an increase from 1993 to uh, probably around the time of the Great Recession, and now uh, Spain's happiness level has come down a bit, but of course, that it only Spain was always a pretty happy country, uh, as far as countries go. Uh, not as happy as uh, Sweden or Brazil, but much happier, but way above average. And the dip in happiness over the last few years only takes uh, Spain back to the level of the uh, first decade of the 21st century. 
Well, I hope to have convinced you that uh, progress is not a matter of personality or temperament or optimism. It is a demonstrable fact. And how is the fact of human progress reflected in the news? Well, I'm going to show you uh, one more graph. This comes from an algorithm called sentiment mapping which just tallies up the number of positive emotion words and negative emotion words in a uh, large sample of news stories. Uh, and it shows that since 1945, during all these years in which the world has become uh, more, uh, more democratic, more peaceful, richer, safer, uh, and happier, the New York Times has gotten uh, glummer and glummer. And a sample of the world's broadcasts has gotten increasingly uh, morose and uh, uh, depressed uh, as well. So why do people deny progress? Part of it comes from the nature of, um, of cognition, of how we estimate risk and probability. People assess risk according to how easily they can recall examples from memory. So for example, most Americans think that tornadoes kill more people than asthma attacks, whereas it's about 40 times in the other direction. But tornadoes make really good television, and asthma attacks, uh, not so much. In fact, consider the nature of news. News is about stuff that happens, not about stuff that doesn't happen. You never see a journalist saying, I'm reporting live from a country that has not been attacked by terrorists or that has been uh, at peace, or a school that has not been shot up. Also, news is about sudden events, not gradual changes. As the economist Max Roser has pointed out, uh, the <clears throat> news could have run the headline, 137,000 people escaped from extreme poverty yesterday, every day for the last 30 years. But they never ran that headline because it did not happen all at once on a particular Thursday in October, with the result that a billion and a quarter people escaped from extreme poverty and no one knows about it. Uh, also, there is a, a kind of a, a bias built into journalism. On top of these natural biases, there is an ethic that to report uh, good news would be to spread complacency and that it's essential to, to spread bad news, to uh, get people uh, to speak truth to power, to not fall into complacency. Uh, satirized in an American humor magazine, which had the satirical headline, CNN holds morning meeting to decide what viewers should panic about for the rest of the day. Well, if you combine the nature of journalism with the nature of the human mind, you can see why the world is coming to an end and always has been. We all are subject to some uh, negativity bias. Uh, psychologists summarize it as bad is stronger than good. We think about and feel bad events more than good ones, especially recent bad events. With the passage of time, we still remember bad things that happened to us, but we forget how bad they were when they were happening. Which leads to an observation from Franklin Pierce Adams that nothing is more responsible for the good old days than a bad memory. <laughs> and there's a, there's a, there are market forces among prophets. Pessimism sounds uh, serious. Optimism sounds uh, frivolous. Uh, a pessimist sounds like he's trying to help you. An optimist sounds like he's trying to sell you something, which is why the American uh, humorist Tom Lehrer once said, always predict the worst and you'll be hailed as a prophet. <laughs> Let me end with three questions about progress and enlightenment that I am sure have occurred to many of you. The first is, isn't it good to be pessimistic, to safeguard against complacency, to uh, be sure that we meet problems? Well, not exactly. It's good to be accurate. That is, of course, we must be aware of suffering and injustice and uh, problems wherever they occur, but we also have to be aware of how they can be reduced because there are dangers to indiscriminate pessimism. Uh, just as there are dangers to excessive complacency, one of them is fatalism. If you think that all of the efforts of humanity to improve the human condition have failed and the world is just getting worse and worse despite all these efforts, well, why waste time and money on a hopeless cause? As Jesus said, the poor will always be with you. Uh, the other danger is radicalism. If you think that all of our institutions are failing and are beyond all hope of reform, then uh, you will 
be receptive to calls to smash the machine, just tear it all down. Anything that rises up out of the ashes is bound to be better than what we have now. It couldn't get any worse. To drain the swamp, burn the empire to the ground, or a, uh, an expression that puts a chill into the uh, heart of every American today, only I can fix it. Is progress inevitable? And the answer is, of course not. Progress does not mean that everything becomes better for everyone, everywhere, all the time. That would not be progress. That would be a miracle. And progress is not a miracle. Progress consists of using knowledge to solve problems, and problems are inevitable. Moreover, solutions create new problems that must be solved in their turn. And even against the incremental uh, background of progress, there can always be nasty surprises, and I've mentioned several of them, the two world wars, the 1960s crime boom, AIDS in Africa, and the American opioid epidemic. And there are severe global challenges that we have not yet solved. Foremost among them are the threat of climate change and the uh, danger of nuclear war. I suggest in uh, my book that the, we should treat these as unsolved but solvable problems rather than as uh, apocalypses in waiting, that we should work to decarbonize the world economy via a combination of policy, like, such as carbon pricing, and technology, namely the development of low, zero, and eventually negative carbon technologies and that we should uh, achieve denuclearization via increases in strategic stability to minimize the chance of an accident or a misunderstanding leading to a nuclear uh, war, uh, and uh, programs in arms limitation and reduction, culminating in ev eventually in the complete abolition of all nuclear weapons. Final question is one that is particularly uh, acute to me as a defender of the uh, idea that there is such a thing as human nature, which is, does the Enlightenment go against human nature? Is humanism, as is sometimes claimed, just too arid or tepid or flattened to get people's uh, heart pumping? Is the conquest of disease, famine, poverty, violence, and ignorance boring? Do people need to believe in miracles, a father in the sky, a strong chief to protect the tribe, myths of heroic ancestors? Well, I don't think so. For one thing, we know that secular liberal democracies are the happiest and healthiest places on earth, and they are the top destination of people who, as we say, vote with their feet. And I would say that applying knowledge and sympathy to enhance human flourishing is heroic, glorious, maybe even spiritual. It's not just a myth, unlike uh, other hero myths, which are fictions. This one is true, true to the best of our knowledge, which is the only truth we can have. And it is a hero story that belongs not just to one tribe, but to all of humanity. For it depends on nothing more than the conviction that life is better than death, health is better than sickness, abundance is better than want, peace is better than war, Freedom is better than coercion, happiness is better than suffering, and knowledge is better than superstition and ignorance. Thank you. Gracias.